for simulations in numerical DR and plays uh, already more than 10 years now at Perimeter Institute. And he'll talk about hydro inspirations for gravity uh, and beyond general DR. Uh, thank you, Vika. So this is uh, for everyone. It's a, uh, maybe a bit of a weird talk. I mean, uh, they, they asked can, me can you maybe put the full screen? Is that possible? Oh, uh, I'm gonna. I need to do it this okay, way. Okay. Okay. If I if I Sorry. need to write something on the slides, this is the only way I can do it. Um, so I was asked to give this talk of of some thoughts or some work that we've been doing for a while, slowly and gradually. Uh, taking some inspirations of observations of gravity, of, of hydrodynamics, uh, and how that may be informing uh, some of the things we're trying or people are trying to do in gravity. So in, in some sense, uh, it comes from left field, given the topics of the conference, but maybe there will be um, things to connect. So let's see how it goes. Um, so what's the framework? So the framework is we want to understand uh, gravity uh, uh, better. Uh, and from that point of view, so to what degree can we trust general relativity uh, uh, being the true theory of gravity that governs uh, especially uh, the regime that we're mostly interested in, uh, which is a strong gravitational regime, highly dynamical, where maybe some potential deviations on general relativity might arise, or maybe in the context of cosmology, this is where people are having uh, uh, passing with these questions. Of course, we know we have plenty of motivations coming from quantum gravity to say that general relativity half is, is deficiency. And people have been working uh, very hard, hard uh, on uh, pro proposing extensions to general relativity. So in some sense, what one has in mind is that people uh, have been, we have at, at, say at our disposal, some maybe truncated form of the true theory of gravity, which is a theory that we still have no clue about. Uh, this truncation comes about from uh, arguments, say, a la effective field theory. Uh, but often what happens once you go beyond general relativity, uh, you begin to see problems very much like the kind of problems you see when you uh, move beyond the perfect fluid description, say, in relativity or dynamics. As you include higher order terms, then some problems begin to arise. And then how do we work with those theories? In particular, people are working out and trying, trying to uh, obtain predictions that uh, detectors like LIGO could go and, and, and try and observe. Um, so I've been struggling with that and mainly because um, these, these theories have mathematical problems that's uh, similar to the ones you've been, we've been hearing uh, last Friday um, that come in and, and really uh, get in the way of trying to calculate. Especially the problem becomes more complicated or, or, or complex in that we are trying to, as I said, go to this regime where uh, it's highly nonlinear, highly dynamical, and any idea of how to do these things from a linearized point of view might actually not be possible or might not be feasible. And so eventually you're gonna go and try to do computations uh, numerically, uh, but the problem stemming from purely analytical uh, reasons uh, will definitely uh, just spoil that effort. So what are we trying to do is just uh, describe some ideas uh, and these ideas will be fairly general. So in some sense, this, uh, this goal is too stupidly ambitious. I don't wanna talk about any particular theory. I just want to say, given the potential problems that uh, the theories will have, and I'll describe some of them, how can we go about uh, trying to get away with murder uh, in a sense um, to, to deal with the problems, but knowing how we do that, to uh, have a feeling of when can we uh, trust the solutions we may be getting. So of course, from, the, uh, from an EFT point of view, what one is doing is uh, beyond say general relativity, uh, one thinks that there are further degrees of freedom, which are kind of at higher energy, more massive. These are integrated out. And as a result, new terms come in and modify the equations. And this, as a result, changes structure of the PDE system, what one has to deal with, uh, but importantly change the physics. Of course, this EFT, so from the very uh, onset, one gets this by under some assumptions, and these are some scale assumptions that says, well, we are in some regime where the corrections are small, and the moment those corrections uh, cease to be small, well, one is beyond the regime of applicability, and this need not be satisfied in general. The problem gets further exacerbated, uh, even if we then remember that 
the anchor theory, which is general relativity, already has in it pathologies or, 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 or features that tell us we may be uh, in a perfect, uh, perfectly nice setup. For instance, we know some sets of initial data uh, which have particular conditions that give us stability of Minkowski. So if we perturb flat spacetime under some conditions, we know through the theorems critical and Kleinerman, we're gonna recover Minkowski. But at the same time, we have the singularity theorems and we know other set of initial data will, which will invariably ride into a singularity. So no matter what EFT I have written, if I'm gonna ride into a singularity, uh, chances are uh, the EFT will be, will be uh, broken unless of course, uh, some sort of cosmic censorship save, save us from uh, that region of the space time where things are going awry. So what is the aim? So the aim is we want, given a particular theory that someone might have written and might want to explore, we want a general statement for such a theory as to how it may uh, manifest potential departures, how do we, can, we can go about trying to measure them, and if so, uh, and we get some consistent with that, maybe will allow us to uh, get some guidance of what is the theory or what is the first correction to general activity that we should be looking at. Um, of course, maybe it's often the situation is different. One wants to explore potential deviations and change, change chances for observations regardless of the particular, particular theory, regardless of pathologies that might, that theory might have. Um, so on that, I should say, uh, the problem is that we want to know, given some interesting set of conditions, what sort of potential behavior we have in the theory we have with the correction terms that we may be uh, trying to explore. And of course, we understand that if we have a potential cascade to the UV, this will have very, very different implications as uh, from a case where we might have a potential cascade to the infrared. And of course, both options depend on particular scenarios and the conclusions will be completely different. And here, I'd like to pause and maybe um, just underline something that was uh, mentioned on, on Friday as talking about well-posed theories. That, that's a bit of an, over, uh, um, an, an incorrect statement. Theories are not well-posed, are the problems, they are the well-posed. I can have just a wave equation and if I don't provide the correct uh, enough uh, initial conditions, the problem would be well posed. So of course, this is completely natural. We all understand that, but it will come and, and have a role in, in what I'm going to say. So I want to keep that in mind. So as a, uh, as a summary of the kind of problems one ends up facing here uh, because of uh, the type of theories that are considered, just let me think of the just a second order wave equation in between quotes and slowly complicated. So if I have a second order wave equation of the first line, the second derivative of the in time with respect to you is some lambda with respect to at times the second derivative in space with you. Uh, okay, lambda, of course, we know uh, the square root of it, it will tell us the velocities of propagation. Some other theories will have like the second line, and this is more like general activity. General activity has a structure. Uh, we have a structure in the wave equations. It, the, the velocities in seemingly depend on the, on the, on the, the, um, the value or, or the behavior of the field at any given point, but because we know of, of the principle of equivalence, this is where we have the, the speed of propagation, the physical speed of propagation and just the speed of, speed of light. The third line, uh, this is more like hydrodynamics where now we have these genuinely nonlinear terms uh, and this might, in, uh, might tell us uh, or might give rise to phenomena like shocks and discontinuities, which when those happen, and when characteristics cross, we need further conditions to guarantee a well-posed uh, solution. Okay, well-posed problem has been defined. But then things can get further, more co further complicated. So in fact, if you have a, a, an equation of this type, mathematicians uh, give up and they say, well, we have no theory for that. And in the type of theories that people are thinking about, one has even further, uh, much more complicated uh, um, uh, ingredients and this I'm just giving some examples. So uh, this is, uh, comes naturally in a theory or in a family of theories called Hordensky. Okay, well, this is similar to something like so, and I'll say a few more things as we go along. But then we have other things like, as a, again, as a quote, an example of what are the gravity where one ends up having this kind of a structure. So uh, quickly one begins to lose contact with what one knows and then begins to uh, try and search for potential ways to obtain solutions. So just as a 
common background, I'm gonna say my goal here is not to advo advocate or analyze a particular theory. If anyone shows up, it's just a matter of example. It's not because I believe that should be the theory that people should be looking at. It's one of the many possible ones I could have uh, picked up. The, my goal would be to discuss issues to bear in mind when considering any possible extension and how we can draw some inspiration from, from hydrodynamics to try and deal with some issues. Argue that these issues will arise generically and some of the possible consequences and how uh, maybe potential discussions of, or discussions of potential ways to plow forward that people have been, uh, have been trying um, and, and maybe what this in store for them. Also, depending on which camp you're in, uh, and if you pick in the extension of uh, to general activity camp, you often will hear things like, um, oh, we, maybe this, this, is, this is okay because we are in the, around the linear regime. And then, uh, especially in the context of cosmology, it has been uh, explored a lot. People take this extension to general activity, linearize over Freeman, Roberts, and Walker, uh, and then try and say, uh, or, or conclude potential uh, consequences of that particular theory. But we always have to remember that linearization stability is not a given. The solution to a linearized equation is not the same necessarily as a solution to the full problem in the linearized regime. So that's a question that people, or that's an issue that people should be mindful of. And also the, uh, you often hear the regime of applicability, these uh, extensions that have higher order operators supposedly being corrections, they better stay small or one begins to lose track of the very assumptions that were employed to write the, uh, the extensions themselves. And then it's a question of what one is doing then. And of course, well postness is more than a requirement. It's, it's something we need to do, we need to have, uh, uh, which will imply things not just for the theory, but for the particular sets of conditions that, and, bound, and, and initial data and boundary conditions one may be interested in. Uh, will define whether one has or not a well posed problem. Another obvious point I think that I'm gonna make, but that often sometimes is, is forgotten is that secondary equations is not enough. Uh, in fact, this family of, of theories within the, the, this name Hordensky theories give rise to the most general, general gravitational uh, theories that you can think of with, which has at most one extra degrees of freedom and keep uh, uh, equations being second order. So often people, especially in the cosmology set, setting, has, have kind of latched onto this to say we're good. But in reality, we're not. We can, we can show and people have uh, uh, explicitly demonstrated that you might, depending again on the set of initial data as you consider, you might completely break the hyperbolicity of the problem itself. Um, and then one technique that people uh, have been using is this one of reduction of order where you say, well, suppose you have these two equations, either this one or that one, and I'm just illustrating here with um, some particular form of the order equations for compressibility and average stokes. Um, and given some scale, you can say, well, I'm gonna imagine that my solution is say five zero plus some scale phi one, and I can solve iteratively. But of course, if I have the left, type of problem, uh, the zero authority will be box of phi zero equals zero. But when I plug that in and try to find for phi one, I will have no change whatsoever. So that would be a counter example of this is being a sensible way of going forward. On the right hand side, well, same thing. If I imagine that uh, I'm, this I'm thinking is a gradient expansion. So the second order derivatives is subleading, I forget it. I solve for the first, or the, the first order, which is this one. Well, this one, uh, will give me rise to uh, turbulence no matter what, because viscosity is zero. But at the next order, my little, uh, my equation for V1 will have to work really hard to try and recover somehow the sense of the laminar regime that we would have in the, in the true physical problem. Um, so I'm not in the torch of time, I'm not gonna say much about this, but this is just, just a few comments of Kordensky. So Kordensky is this theory, I mean, if you, if you, or this family of theories, but if you go, uh, you can find uh, very recent work um, that shows that there are regimes where the hyperbolic problem completely breaks down. Uh, you actually move into an elliptic problem uh, and then you're gonna have serious issues to thinking that this might be uh, something that you can describe gravity with. But there are regimes where, well, the problems happen to be inside a black hole 
or other regimes where initial conditions give rise to a perfectly well-behaved evolution and you recover, say, Minkowski. So it's, it, there is a, a lot of uh, freedom in the type of phenomenology that you may have. Um, so, but let me describe, and this is the connection with, um, with uh, hydro uh, and then potential options. And this, uh, I'll describe what we've been doing uh, on this front. So I describe already one method, uh, which is this perturbative or reduction of order, how way people call it, where you say, well, these extra corrections, I'm gonna just uh, iteratively uh, account for by solving first, in this case, the generativity problem, and then evaluate potential right corrections uh, iteratively through the previous solution. So people are using this in, in some very complicated theories and even pointing out to uh, what the deviations in gravitational waves may be. There are reasons, and the two examples I gave before uh, are, are examples of um, the, the reasons I would think that's not the way I want to go. I want to go in a different way, a way that I think I don't throw away the baby with the bathwater and I have more control. And that is where I take some inspirations from hydrodynamics. And the, the idea here in, in, in just a nutshell is following some of the uh, philosophy behind this Israel Stewart formulation. So again, if I have this kind of theory, so if I have like, sorry, this kind of theory, I'm gonna modify it into this where I introduce uh, other variables, these variables in this case, uh, the variables f set or the family of variables f and i'm going to give it a an evolution equation so that asymptotically in a time scale given by lambda which is important to know it's it's both a, it's, it's a feature of the problem and the dependence of the solution on this lambda will be important and in a time scale given by lambda i'm going to force this extra variable f to reduce to s the important thing on, on the phys on physical ground is that this gives me back some new degrees of freedom, which I can show, at least in some regime, has some connections to these putative degrees of freedom, at least the most relevant one, that I integrated out to end up with the theory I had to work with. So this gives me some sense of physics that may be very useful. Um, so just, just, I mean, everyone here uh, similarly, I don't. I didn't know this crowd. Similarly, knows about the um, Israel Stewart formulation. So let me just for, uh, as, assume that everyone knows. If not, give me uh, ask me a question. Um, and I'm going to just promise to you that we have used in it in some uh, complicated uh, theory. So, for instance, we consider this theory. In of course, in the simple regime of spherical symmetry, to study them in, in particular. And using this kind of philosophy and with a bit of more in a bit extended way, we can show that uh, this theory can be easily uh, tracked uh, numerically. And there are very important consequences uh, on physical grounds that this theory will lead to. Um, and depending on the coupling the, given by K, uh, this, this um, slight difference in the solutions could be observable in gravitational waves. Um, so let me just say, go back to why fixing it and then uh, mention some uh, further examples. So the true, the problem that we are dealing with, and I, I, I try to say, uh, or make it, make it as explicit as I could at the very beginning, is that we might have a theory. Uh, that theory might be such that even though these correcting terms are at higher orders, the, the philosophy people have in mind is that, well, any truncation is in reality only a, a limited form of the theory we want to have. Uh, the, the hope is that if we keep adding the further and further terms, eventually those uh, problems that any correcting term introduces or any truncation introduces will be cure somehow by the further correcting terms that we have yet to include. So that's at the kind of formal or philosophical level. At the practical level, well, we have the theory we have and we want to work with it. So the problem is that might be that there are regimes and those regimes uh, are such that if I choose data around some specific neighborhood of those regimes where everything is fine. So let's say this is kind of represented by this simple graph. The problem gets exacerbated at the numerical level because now I want to study this in the, in the very nonlinear regime. I need a computer uh, or simulations to help me uh, look into this, but numerics introduce 
uh, even though small, uh, frequencies in, uh, in, in that describe initial data that's, that are beyond this kind of green area where things are fine. In fact, I might have a little bit of a support where things are really nasty and really bad. So we want a way to kind of control this piece, think of trade the evolution of, uh, of the type of data we're interested in, making this uh, be under control and be able to ask questions as to whether this evolution is sensible or not, and where it depends on this further, this extra time scale that we have introduced through this lambda parameter. If it depends sensitively on that lambda parameter, then I know that what I've done with my fixing is just I play too much uh, uh, the role of God and I so much modify my system that now I'm getting something that may have no connection whatsoever with the theory I really wanted to uh, analyze. But if this, the dependence on that parameter is, is subtle or, or, or really negligible, then I know what I'm, the solution I'm getting is uh, giving me some insights of what the true behavior of that theory should be. Of course, the argument or the philosophy of the Hordensky of, of the Israel Stewart is to control the high derivatives. But I mentioned that we have these theories like Hordensky where there are no higher derivatives. Would the same idea work? When the argument is, is obvious and it's, it's with a very simple, very local argument, one can argue in the same way that we, we would help. So if you take this theory that doesn't have higher order derivatives but have correcting terms that are this kind of messy terms like this, if we go kind of locally, non-ultra local analysis, well, this, uh, and you introduce Fourier modes, this is roughly how this, this right-hand side would, would scale. Um, and it's very similar to the scale I would have in an EFT where say I, my correcting term has zero order derivatives. The only difference is that these correcting terms here depend more in a nonlinear way with respect to the background solution, but very much the same argument goes through and we have uh, explicit examples where this, this is just fine. Where one can control the evolution. So what is the strategy we're advocating? Well, we know we can want to control the high, the high frequency part of the solution. We want to ensure strong hyperbolicity. By that, in order to do this, we introduce these further variables. These variables are given some ad hoc evolution that have these parameter, extra parameters that ensure the convergence of my variables to the type of expressions I need to recover the original system I had to begin with. There is no unique way to do this, but if the, at the end of the day, the simulation shows a very strong dependence on that non-uniqueness, again, you know that what we're getting or what one would be getting is not representative of the solution, true solution one would be looking for uh, with these, uh, coming naturally from this extension. So this is a, uh, a Lidman test as to whether one should trust what one is getting or not. And as an example, I go back to uh, the Israel Stewart formulation and think of this dichotomy of just using the same uh, equations of motion in two plus one dimensions versus three plus one dimensions. So in three plus one dimensions, turbulence generates these eddies. These eddies cascade down to the UV. So I, I'm someone who is very suspect of the use of stratus Stewart formulation in these scenarios, because I know the physics is cascading to UV and then my correction is messing up with that physics. So of course one can do the due diligent work to try and understand to what degree that solution should be trusted. But on the other hand, if one works in two plus one dimensions, their ener energy primarily cascades in the opposite direction and one applying the Israel Stewart formulation there, there is very little Rel, uh, dependence on this extra time scale parameter and the way things have done. And this is the second, um, the second connection to using hydrodynamics uh, as a motivation in gravity. And the second motivation, it comes from the fluid gravity correspondence. This is a set of, uh, uh, or a topic for a whole different top, uh, talk. But if, for those of you that do not know, um, in some recent years have been um, the recognition that gravity, general relativity in some special setting with a negative cosmological constant can be mapped one-to-one -to, -one, uh, to second order in the gradient expansion to relativistic hydrodynamics in a one lower dimensional. 
setting. So that is gravity in three plus one dimensions with a negative cosmological constant is equivalent to re relativistic hydrodynamic for a conformal fluid in one lower dimension. So there is much more, uh, there's a much more tighter connection between the behavior of gravity and the behavior of gravity in one, uh, in one dimension lower with respect to the hydrodynamics. And one can draw significant information out of it. In particular, both for new phenomena in gravity and guidance for uh, how to deal with some problems in hydro that has uh, an, a counterpart in, 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 in gravity itself. So this gives me further confidence that uh, this theory or this way of thinking um, might be the, the right way or one certainly uh, reasonable way of going forward. So as a last example, uh, uh, because of time, let me just give you a couple of options that, or a few examples of, uh, of the theory of the problems that we're dealing with with this philosophy and showing that things are fine. So for instance, you have this equation, again, this equation, this an equation where you can show the system is with respect, regardless of the initial data one is uh, considering, will give rise to a nil pose problem. Um, if you think of it this way, but if you change it to this problem, you can show that as long as this tau, this time scale uh, obeys that relation, uh, then you have a well posed problem. And then if you analyze initial data that have kind of long wavelength uh, uh, support, you can show that the evolution of it uh, is well behaved uh, and representative of the true solutions you wanted to obtain for the original problem. If you have this R1, where now we have say four spatial derivatives on the right hand side. Well, if you write it this way, things are fine while in the opposite, they were not. Uh, this is a bit more complicated. So again, we st we're still staying in second order uh, equations motion, but you could choose to say, write it this way. If you use kind of, again, and this rather two or like, or this way, and it is this way coupled to either this, if you want to include an evolution equation for the extra variable, which is second order, or this, which is first order, either one will give you a hyperbolic, you can show that the end of the have, you have a strongly hyperbolic system uh, and everything is, is just fine with respect to uh, having a way to plow forward and, and get solutions from the system. So, as I said, as long as you kind of follow these guiding principles, introducing these new variables to capture this extra structure, ensure that whatever system you have is strongly hyperbolic and introduce constraints to respect the original system in the infrared, like this is that, this term, these two terms are added for that region. Uh, for that reason, you uh, have a way to control the problems of the theory that you're gonna study. And then from there on, the work really begins, which is to then put it in or, or, or simulate it and check whether your solution depends very sensitively on these time scales that you have introduced. If so, then I would doubt the solution being rep representative of what you were looking for to begin with. But if it's not, then uh, you're in, in a pretty good regime. Um, so here, I'm just gonna uh, end by saying that I think this is a good and control way to plow ahead and, and, and uh, explore extensions of gravity, which are one you may be interested in, both very complicated second order theories and higher order derivative theories have been, uh, we have shown to, uh, or we have very strong reasons to believe, believe uh, uh, are just fine. Um, we have in our work provided explicit potential limitations of this reduction of order, which is a method that is uh, mainly used, but I'm happy some other people are exploring it because it, uh, 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 it, it, some, it, it, it is providing some in, in interesting information. Um, and this combination of gravitational waves plus this fluid gravity correspondence gives me hopes that trying to see gravity and, and get intuition from um, uh, what we know from hydrodynamics through an, a lens of EFT is a, is a worthwhile uh, pursuit, not just to try and think of how to fix problems, but also how to explore uh, new phenomenology 
that we might not have uh, known or, or thought of before in the context of, of gravity. So with that, I'll stop. I think this is, maybe I'm, I'm going enough. Thank you. Thanks for a nice talk. Uh, well, there's, uh, I think yeah, everybody can type in the chat or raise their hand. Uh, let's start with Pavel. Um, hi, Luis. Hi, Pavel. Um, pa Pavel Korfton here. Um, so, could you comment on um, the sensitivity uh, to that uh, parameter tau uh, that you are introducing? Because uh, as you said, your solutions should not uh, sensitively depend on that tau. So doesn't that depend on the choice of, um, or does it depend on the choice of the initial conditions? Uh, and how do you go about just making sure that uh, that uh, sensitivity to the choice of tau is uh, minimized? Oh, I don't think we know. That's a problem. So it, it depends on where we have a problem where we have uh, some reasonable knowledge of what to expect. So I can ask, I can answer in general and then uh, in particular. So in general, I don't think we do know. Uh, we, if, if we have a problem that we have never seen before, we have to explore. And this gives you a way to explore. So we choose, so Masaru was giving some examples so that were tied to physics to choose what relaxation time scale might be. And then you can try with that. And then I would go kind of put, putting the, the experience Explorer hats an order of magnitude above, an order of magnitude below, and see what the, the uh, dependence is. And if, and if it's sens very sensitive to that, then we're in trouble. On the other hand, if we are talking about very particular problems, so one thing we've seen, and this is, so this, thanks for this question, gives me another opportunity to mention that. So if there is something we have seen already, uh, uh, is that gravitational waves uh, are coming from whatever true theory of gravity is there in nature. When we look at the structure of the gravitational waves, and we, we believe that we're seeing, say, black holes colliding, we, were, we don't see a lot of structure in higher, in higher modes. So whatever those are, they are small. So what it does seem to be the case is that if we're exploring, um, say, theories around black holes that are, are given a certain scale, that already gives us some sense of what should be a reasonable uh, time scale to think of and what to expect uh, not sensitivity on. And if we do see sensitivity on that, then we're in trouble. And, and that wouldn't be a theory that should be, uh, that I would be proposing as if the, the, the theory of gravity. This, whatever correcting terms uh, there are, are staying small, even though we're colliding black holes at almost at a large fraction of the speed of light. But in general, I don't think we know, Paul. We just have to explore different scenarios. Of course, we will start from a physics point of view, not to ask what is the most general set of initial conditions that given this theory, uh, I will say, um, will respect this assumption. I will kind of flip it and say, well, what are the, in this, the situations I'm interested in? In particular, I'm interested, interested in collision of black holes, or I'm in interested in the stability of FRW. I'll use that and explore around those. Okay, yeah, thanks. So next is Travis. Hi, Louis. Thanks for the really nice talk. Um, I guess I have a lot of questions, but maybe I'll come back to them if, if there's time after. I guess my first question is, um, does this weak dependence on lambda imply that uh, there necessarily has to be some sort of attractor to make the theory work? So when you say that there's a weak dependence on lambda, at some point, the physics has to be the same regardless of what I put in for lambda. And if that's the case, how do we think about the transient region, uh, the transient region regime of that physics? Is it like, is it completely unphysical or is there something we can get out of it? Or? Oh, interesting question. I, I'm not sure I can answer using your analogy. Let me try a different one uh, if for no other reason to try a, a vaguer question. No, no, seriously, no. So if I think of, uh, so just let's think of a wave, uh, a wave system. So wave, so we have, we may have a competition between dispersal and singularity formation. So what I would argue is that we, in the regimes where uh, this dependence would be uh, sub-leading and or, or, or not very crucial, we are in a regime where dispersion is winning. Um, so that's it, the, the kind of uh, thinking I, I have. 
And if there is any cascade towards the UV, that cascading is not uh, strong. So if I, now trying to, you're forcing me to try and use um, more your terminology, and this is something that you haven't thought in many years. But it, what I would say is perhaps the system is not ergodic around, and, and, and this is not the same as saying there is a fixed point, but it's, it's maybe closer to it, right? It's not ergodic, it's not trying to explore all possible high frequencies uh, or all, all possible uh, yeah, modes uh, and some of them being high frequency because if it goes there, we're in trouble and we would see the dependence. So what I think is that you would argue that there are some sort of initial conditions where the system naturally wants to evolve in a non-ergodic fashion towards uh, the IR or a regime where there is not significant cascade UV. I'm not sure if I'm asking, answering the question you you like me to answer, but hopefully it's close enough. No, I, I think, yeah, I think you do have some different terminology, but I think you understand the question I'm asking, but it does, it does in some way. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Maybe next is George. Hi, Luis, thanks a lot for this talk. So I, so I have a question um, regarding, you know, how to actually, you know, how one would actually solve these things in, in a really in a non-perturbative way, like, you know, Imagine that these corrections are not really, you know, very tiny, or you do perturbatively, like iterating the solution. So, I mean, just even in GR, if you were to just, you know, close your eyes and compute the characteristics, of course, you would, you know, find an obvious uh, issue because you know that you have to, you know, uh, fix a gauge choice, right? And then in GR is understood that you know you can do several different types of gauge, and you can prove that this thing is propagated throughout the evolution afterwards. But when it comes to these theories that you don't, you know, know so much. So how, how do you go, you know, what, what is the general strategy? I mean, is there any general strategy? Like you just start with some gauge and then do the calculations, hope to God that it's okay. And then you can try to prove that actually the thing uh, is propagated throughout the evolution. Is there any uh, insight like that or it's still not at that point yet? No, no, I think there is a lot of insight. So let me just perhaps go back a little bit to the top of your question because uh, Franz, Masaru and uh, several others that come from numerical relativity would We'll cringe a little bit of saying, oh, you get just, just a gauge and we go forward. No, no, we, we pay uh, with blood and tears uh, trying to understand how even in GR, which at the simplest possible level, you use harmonic and then you realize that oh, this is just set of a wave equation, uh, how to go forward. So it's not just a gauge, it's also the choose of variables, the, cho the choice of variables. Sure certainly tell you where you have a system that is strongly hyperbolic or not. The standard ADM is weakly hyperbolic and no I matter what you do, it's screw, screw there. So we do know that, okay, so that's, so well postness is a must uh, and that requires from kind of in some ways the strong hyperbolicity at the very least. So that's how we would start. So we, I would start and also any extension of GR in some sense is built from GR. So at the very least, whatever you do, GR should be fine. Um, so an example is in the context of Orneski, uh, Papal and Real work precisely in that way. So well, now you're gonna use, say, a generalized harmonic way of writing the equations. Uh, how do, can we choose the gauge to guarantee that strong hyperbolicity is satisfied? So you copy what you've learned from the struggles on the generative front and you translate it into this larger domain. And I, uh, so I have a colleague here, Will East, who is precisely using this formulation of Copal and Real and having really good um, results using it. So the guiding principle of looking for a strong hyperbolicity, hyperbolicity and any constraints that you have, you want to make sure it's either enforced explicitly or implicitly, those are a must to start. Okay. Mm, well, maybe I have one last question myself. So, so you stress a little bit like the, the, the well posedness and the singularities on, in hydro or like turbulence. And then you mentioned the fluid gravity, of course, so that they can use hydro to learn about gravity. But then in some sense, gravity is much richer, right? I always think about fluid gravity as being the fluid, just being the horizon dynamics. And then behind the horizon, there is the singularity. So you have in some sense many more singularities in gravity than in just fluids. And well, then you can also have singularities in fluids like turbulent cascades, uh, but in some sense, these are, these are not the same, right? No, they are not the same. And in fact, it's, it's, it's an interesting way of putting it. So it depends what you put your lens on. You might say see, gravity is richer or gravity is more boring. And in the sense that, so in, in hydrodynamics, you have crossing of characteristics. When they cross, 
you lose uniqueness. So you need to impose an extra condition to, to find the, or, or define what the, the solution should be past that point. Gravity, fortunately, doesn't have that problem. Gravity as in GR. So gravity as in GR doesn't have that problem. The characteristics don't cross. So you have, you have one of two, two, two things, either a singularity or things are fine. The problem is that now when we add these correcting terms, we're making gra generativity or well, gravity no longer behave nicely as in generativity, but in the muck as hydrodynamics. So you may end up get, getting the, the combination of both. With respect to singularities, well, as long as we can have singularity, the, the theory doesn't make sense to define a theory from a kind of a metric tensor point of view. And, and so there, the best you can hope of is the same thing you can hope of in generativity, which, which would be, a, uh, if they do take place, they take place inside of an event horizon, and then you can excise them away and, and keep asking questions with respect to what the observable should behave like. Okay, well, also time is up, so thanks again for also the talk. Um, mm -hmm.